Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to today's session. My name is Miriam Chamberlain, and I am one of the event hosts today. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you uh, our speaker today, Gabby Fish. Gabby is a coach, consultant, and trainer, um, and she is a former HR and learning leader who spent 16 years in corporate, nonprofit, and startup spaces. About 18 months ago, Ab um, Gabby started her own company, Move Forward, to help individuals thrive and reach their potential and organizations to build magnetic cultures rooted in learning, growth, and development. Super exciting. Now, before we dive in, just a couple, uh, just a couple key points. We do want to have this as an engagement, uh, engaging session. So, please feel free to put in your um, comments in the chat, and then throughout the session, if you have any questions, um, feel free to pop them into the Q and A um, segment, and then I'll moderate the Q and A um, when we have the last ten minutes of the of the session. If anyone wants to come on stage um, at any time, please put up your hand, and we would definitely welcome you to uh, to join us interactively. And just one final note, the session today is being recorded. Um, and on that note, I will throw it over to you, Gabby, to get us started. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Miriam. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here today. Um, so you all chose to attend this breakout session. Thank you very much. And so I'm guessing that that means that you are a little bit compelled by the title and uh, it's it's a bit of a long one. <laughs> it's always intriguing to learn something surprising and we will. But first, let's establish why an organizational culture rooted in feedback and growth is worth striving for. So here is the model that I ascribe to. It's I call it the development flywheel. It's the idea that once we exert the effort to set things in motion with the added fuel of a community of peers, the habits get reinforced, the wheel keeps turning, and the forward motion and evolution of the people and the company happens. So I believe that good feedback practices are where we start, and we're going to get into kind of what that means. That really does create a more vulnerable uh, population where we have kind of dropped some of our armor. We understand ourselves and how we are perceived more, which is self-awareness, and we are learning. And when we are in that state, we are more creative and we establish better relationship dynamics which really leads us to reach new heights with innovations from creativity and velocity, which means we can go faster and further. And really, this takes us to a place where people who care about growth and relationships stick around. And, and these days, I think that's worth quite a bit. We need to create places where people wanna come and they wanna stay. So the idea of the development flywheel is inspired by this book, which was quite pivotal in my career when I read it about five or six years ago, and it has continued to really guide and inspire me. It's called An Everyone Culture, Becoming a Deliberately Developmental Organization by Bob Keegan, Lisa Leahy, and three other co-authors. Who has heard or read this book? If you could just punch an emoji there so I can see reactions of how, how well known this is in this group. Oh, I'm not seeing much. So if you haven't read it and you're excited by the prospect of shaping an organizational culture that's rooted in helping people learn, grow, and reach their potential, then definitely check it out. So this book really opened my eyes to what it could look and feel like inside, um, you know, a culture oriented in this way. So some of the hallmarks of deliberately developmental organizations. So organizations that put a lot of deliberate, intentional effort around it, development of its people are that they really consider development a team sport. So Sachi in this morning session talked about well-being as a team sport. Here we talk about development as a team sport, the idea that a community and we use the workplace as our community to help us learn and grow. We really leverage that. Um, that's what kind of the spirit is here. 
In these organizations, learning is prioritized. It's not like totally on top of the work. It is part of the work. Um, we are working on ourselves and we are working on the business. Again, the idea where we drop the armor that we often wear and put around us and vulnerability and humility is really required to operate here. Uh, discomfort that comes from that is normalized. And, you know, deliberately development as organizations look at the organizational challenges posed by human beings, because we pose a lot when we interact. They think of them as adaptive challenges, which means that they just don't require new skills to tackle, but a whole new way of looking at things, a whole new mindset. So taking the lens of an, of an organization as an, a, a complex adaptive system. All that, all that sounds pretty similar to some of the hallmarks of um, psychological safety. So these environments where growth is prioritized have all the same requirements and, and ideas as the idea of psychological safety. So they are very much the same thing. Now, as we said, organizations that take learning seriously, well, feedback is absolutely central. Feedback practices are taught, reinforced, normalized, and infused into the cultural fabric widely. So given that feedback is the topic of today's session and it's the catalyst of the development flywheel, let's do just a very quick level set on what we mean here, okay? So this is a very simple definition that I really like. Feedback is information about the past, given in the present, with the goal of influencing behavior or performance in the future, okay? Encompasses quite a bit. And we know that in very broad terms, feedback can either be reinforcing. So what we think of as positive, praise, appreciation, you're basically saying, do more of this. Or it can be redirecting feedback, what we think of as constructive or negative feedback, typically you're illuminating some negative impact or some poor performance and the messages do less of this. And while there is a lot of value in developing skill in both sides here, um, it's the redirecting feedback, the constructive feedback that tends to trip us up most often if we think uh, in our organizations, you know, what we coach managers a lot on, it's probably that constructive feedback. And uh, that's a, what a lot of the training and a lot of the literature does tend to focus on. And so why does this trip us up? Well, it's all related to our pesky limbic system in our brain. So this is David Rock's really awesome model of SCARF. And so it really, what um, it's, it's explaining here, SCARF stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, or what we think of as belonging, and fairness. And these are social triggers of the our brain's threat response. They, they can be, okay? They can trip up our threat response. And uh, that's what we think of as an amygdala hijack or the fight, flight, fright, or freeze um, uh, reaction that we can have when we feel threatened. And, you know, this is a social threat. It's not a real physical threat, but it can still trip the wire in the same way. When that happens, our rational mind is clouded, our perception narrowed, and we can't think clearly. We don't have all of our faculty and resources at our disposal. So the perceived loss of any of these values or elements can trip up the threat response. And on the flip side, appealing to these same values tends to tr trigger the neurochemical processes of the reward response. So when you're trying to influence someone, you're going to want to appeal to one or more of these values here. And um, you see this a lot in, in sales training when people are being taught how to sell and influence. So a quick example, you can imagine, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a recent grad, two years out of school, a team member, always been a great performer, always been like an A student. So really, really used to being, you know, a favorite and, and doing well, being well thought of. 
So he does a presentation, let's say, and afterwards his manager uh, pulls him aside and says, um, you know, please don't attend your next meeting. I'd like to have a debrief for the presentation. Come into my office or let's have it. Let's have a Zoom chat. And the manager might say, you know, I'm a bit disappointed with how uh, things turned out. I'm not sure you took the right approach. You didn't have all the data ready to support your argument and it made our team look unprepared. So that kind of feedback, there's a good chance that that's gonna trigger uh, the threat response in that person. Um, maybe even hitting all of these triggers status like how you know how important am i to you now if i just did a poor job certainty well i was about to go into this meeting and now this happened i don't know what to expect autonomy being able to have control over what's happening so you didn't choose that this is when i want to receive this feedback relatedness do you not like me anymore is my you know uh, do i not belong here in this team and fairness, well, you just said you just blamed me for how the team is perceived. That doesn't sound fair. So all of these thoughts could be going through their head. And all of these things, as we know, inhibit <laughs> the receiver of the feedback from examining, considering, understanding the feedback, and potentially learning from it. It's harder for us when that uh, trigger is set off. So does that mean that we just should not give feedback or we should give it less? I do not, I absolutely believe that is not the case. I believe we should get more skillful and understand how these triggers happen and do it better. Do it in a way that has a lesser chance of tripping these wires so that people can actually consider it. But Giving feedback isn't actually this surprising thing. Giving feedback isn't gonna be what we're gonna be focusing on today. There is actually a full suite of skills in the feedback bucket. And I do, um, I do a whole learning program focusing on, on each of these. Um, and you really do need to build strength in all of these elements to leverage feedback and all the learning that it engenders. So as we know, we just talked about giving feedback. There is skill and understanding we can develop in receiving feedback well. Then there's reflecting on feedback, a whole skill set of how to do that really well. Considering it, because not all of it's gonna be valuable. We're not gonna accept it all. Uh, acting upon feedback. So how do we take a small experiment, a safe to try step and see how that might work, you know, based on something we heard. And then the idea of building it into continuous development, like layering in, recalibrating. So these are all elements that I think of, the full suite of feedback skills. And there's one more. As you may have guessed, it is asking. This is what I think is the surprising ingredient into building a culture of feedback. And why is it surprising? Well, because we really haven't been utilizing it very well, or certainly not to its fullest potential in most organizations. And because it's actually a unique point of leverage, and it's a catalyst. Point of leverage is like it's a relatively small amount of effort to have a very large impact. Let me explain. So, when you ask for feedback, um, you know, of all the scarf possible triggers of the threat response, when you ask, you take back control, okay? Feedback is not being done to you. You get to choose when, where, to whom, the modality, is it Slack, is it an email, is it a quick chat, is it a phone call, like, how do you ask? That is on you, so you have autonomy. You can prepare yourself, you can set your mindset. You can say, okay, that was a big bomb. Let me collect myself, let me get myself into the right mindset, and then let me ask how I could have done that better. You are kind of putting a stake in the ground for learning, for building strength, courage, developing a practice. So you are choosing all these positive positive things that if you wait to be given feedback, you may not get in the same way. And 
the more you ask for feedback, the more volume of data you can sift through, detect patterns, and understand blind spots. You can think like, where have I heard this before? Or you can validate it and say, someone just told me this, so-and-so, my friend, my peer, like I got this piece of feedback. I wonder if this is a blind spot. Do you see me doing this? So these are all opportunities um, when you ask more. Now, not all ways of asking are created equally. I can recall a situation a few years ago um, when my boss, my manager, was uh, doing a presentation at a very large town hall, big stage, big lights. And uh, she, she was a, a bit of a shaky presenter, not very comfortable and, and not even very skilled. So when she got off stage and we were kind of mingling, she said, did that go okay? And it made it very hard for me to say anything other than, yeah, yeah, it was great. I'm sure you can all relate to that kind of situation. It's very common. In fact, when I suggest to leaders that they ask for feedback more, those are the kinds of questions they typically come up with. So, you know, did that go okay? How do you think that went? I, and even, I bombed that, right? When you ask these kinds of questions, these are the kinds of answers you tend to hear. Remember, we as humans tend to shy away from discomfort confrontation, ruffling feathers. So askers, people who want to seek more feedback, are going to need to work a little harder to convince others that they really want honest feedback. And even when you do, it may not happen right off the bat. But like anything that you want to embed into your culture, it's a practice that needs to be continually reinforced. So, so I'm going to give you a few ideas of how you can build the asking muscle, okay? These are some kind of general buckets of, of ways of asking. So um, declaring a development goal. So one quick way is, you know what? I want to work, people say this with New Year's resolutions. This, this year I'm going to do so-and-so. So what do you want to declare? I've noticed I interrupt a lot in meeting guys and I really want to work on that. <laughs> Can I please ask you to help me when I do? And like one fun way that I often work with teams in doing is like interrupting is kind of an easy one to do that with. Is get a funny word, find a funny word like bananas or lollipop. And whenever <laughs> that thing happens, ask your people to like say this funny word. It's a lighthearted way to get feedback on something you want to work on. So, so that, that's one idea. Another idea is the angle of how can I be more helpful? So you might ask, you know, I think a lot of leaders already do this in their one-on-ones or at the end of the year at the um, performance review. What's one thing I can do differently or more to help you in your work? Um, so I have a funny, not an interesting story about this one. One of my clients, a, a, an executive I was coaching, asked that. And one of their direct reports said, well, I'd really like you to hold me more accountable. And she was really like caught off guard. This is like a really star performer. She's like, I have so many things I want to work on and you don't hold me accountable. Like you always understand when I can't get to it but I need external accountability structure. So I would like you to really expect <laughs> these projects from me and not give me a pass all the time. And so that leader in our coaching session, she's like, I'm having a hard trouble, hard time with this. Cause I don't, I don't want to be that strict. Like I understand that she's busy. And so when you think about it, she's like, so is this development for me? Or like, well, how, how do I think about this? And what we kind of came to in the discussion is that, She's asking you for you to be the kind of leader or accountability partner that she wants and needs to reach her own goals, to stretch herself. And so that was kind of how the conversation went. So even though how can I be more helpful can still be feedback. It's like, how, how can I be what you need in a different way? Blind spots, big thing around feedback. So asking questions like, what do you see me doing or failing to do? that might be getting in my own way or getting in my way of accomplishing X, right? What are some of the unintended impacts I may be having that I don't know about? 
So uh, another uh, bucket of questions is those intention and impact questions. So this is a, an interesting one um, where you, this is, an, this is a good way of getting people to share feedback without them having to share an assessment of you did poorly, you did well. So you self-generate the feedback first. So let's say a presentation or a meeting went poorly. You say, so I know I made my, some mistakes or I know that went really poorly. Can you help me figure out where maybe I veered off course, right? So you're not having the person say, I don't think it went well. So you're taking that weight off them and you're actually helping them discern perhaps what could have been the trouble spot. And then finally, the idea of good to great. This is also called feed forward. Marshall Goldsmith kind of coined this phrase where you ask like, instead of assessing anything from the past, what are a couple things, what's one thing, what's two things I could do differently or better in the future, right? About that meeting, about how we run our one-on-ones, how we run our team meetings, about how I, anything, right? So it's not that anything is bad, but what could make it better? I'm gonna pause here. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, great. So perhaps you've already embedded some of these practices or already do them or see them done in your organization. Perhaps these give you a couple of ideas to try. Um, and I encourage you to try them because beyond what they will give you from a learning um, uh, benefit, like these things like demonstrating asking, Showing people, giving people the idea to ask generates a much bigger cultural impact. So let's talk about amplifying the impact. So as we talked about, you can simply ask broadly. You can ask specifically like we just went over. Even better. Even better, is it actually being voluntary? And I've got a story to share here. So I was working with a team, crafting different feedback processes for them uh, collectively. And um, they said, yeah, 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 we're gonna do quarterly uh, 360s. We'll institute quarterly 360s. So everyone does a 360, a short one every quarter. And that could generate awesome feedback. It could be valuable, absolutely. But even better is if it's available, and people choose to do it. Why? Because you have that element of choice. It's not being done to you. So you get those self benefits of the feedback. And number two, people know that it's voluntary and they know you really want it. You're really seeking it. You really care. And that increases the chance that they'll really give you good, honest feedback. To amplify the impact even more, is if people actually see you applying the feedback they gave you. So you're not always gonna do it. It's not always gonna be valid. You're not always gonna wanna do it. That is fair. But when people do give you feedback and they see it, they are much more likely to continue to be encouraged to give you feedback. And finally, when you appreciate it, authentically, genuinely, it's incredibly powerful also to kind of build that muscle, build that flywheel and habit. So uh, an idea is, you know, someone gives you some feedback and you're thinking about it and you're really thinking about it. And, and maybe a few days later, you send them a quick Slack note or in the future, you bump into them in the hall and um, you say, I just wanted to thank you again. Like I've really been thinking about you, what you said. I've noticed it in different parts of my life and thank you so much. That has a huge impact in increasing the chances they will kind of go out on a limb and give honest feedback again to you or to others or maybe even seek it themselves. And finally, the biggest amplifier is if you happen, if, is it, if it's a leader doing the act, asking, okay? If it's a, 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 someone with positional power, someone with authority in the organization and influence, because we know uh, asking for feedback and asking for it in a vulnerable, 
humble way, uh, increases, as we know, psychological safety and increases trust in organizations when leaders show that, you know, like we're all a work in progress. I want to learn. I want to do better. And finally, role modeling. So when like any cultural change you're trying to instill in an organization, when it doesn't apply to the leaders or where people, when people don't see the top of the house, the execs doing it, you're not going to get very far. So huge leverage, huge amplification when the leaders are modeling asking. All right. So what we know, we know that getting useful feedback is one of the fastest ways to growth and improve performance. And you can't know before you get it if it's going to be useful to you. <laughs> so sometimes you'll consider it and discount it, but sometimes it'll be an amazing nugget for you. And it's not always going to be an accurate reflection of who you are, but it is going to be a reflection of how you're perceived by at least one person. And knowing how you're perceived is uh, very much part of gaining self-awareness and critically important in any kind of leadership role because you need to cultivate followers. And finally, um, the more you ask, <laughs> the more reps you get, you're increasing the chance of getting helpful feedback by getting into that habit you are setting an example and you are setting the development flywheel in motion. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, very much enjoyed the visuals, that's for sure. I'm a, I'm a visual person, so I Thanks. love the wheels and everything. Very good. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A. Um, I will kick it off with a question because you did, uh, we touched on um, management 360s, right? So that was uh, something that you had brought up. Um, in your opinion, how can they be, um, how can we use them more effectively in the workplace? Yeah, so, um, so there's all sorts of, okay. One of the best ways is when they're developmental, like to actually make mm -hmm. them be valuable is when they're purely developmental and not evaluatory, right? So that mm. like has been shown to increase the chance that people really give more honest feedback is if, if people believe that like your performance rating or your bonus is going to be influenced by what I say here, it de decreases that, that level of candor. Um, so that is one way, um, when they're developmental, they're more helpful to the person. However, there are instances where, you know, to properly evaluate how someone's doing, you absolutely do need, like a manager only knows kind of one dimension of the work. So it, it is very helpful to get a rounded view if evaluation is your goal. So mm -hmm. that's, there's, there's two ways, um, of, of using them really well, like for sure, Feedback from an evaluatory 360 can be valuable for development, but in terms of setting the conditions for the most, you know, frank uh, feedback would be when evaluation is not part of the outcome. And um, and based on your experience, Gabby, what would you say is um, an ideal frequency of putting forward management 360s in an organization? Yeah, so management 360 is interesting. I, I'm a big believer in 360s for like, anyone in the organization oh, for anyone yes yeah, yeah. um we'll just focus on management ones yeah yeah so management um i mean it's hard there's so much fatigue in the organization like, we're mm. being asked to do so much engagement surveys and frequency of engagement surveys is going up so you have to balance how much people are being asked to do um and also you have to balance how long it takes to see change so i mean annual is great um more than annual well, then I think it should be very, very, very short, like a couple of, you know, like a, I know a lot of organizations do very quick stop, start, continue kind of one. And so that can be done a bit more frequently. Um, but uh, but a, a longer exhaustive one around, you know, uh, management or leadership competencies, it's tough to do it more than once a year, I would I would think. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, we do have actually a question that came through from Lauren. So uh, she says, thank you, Gabby. 
Um, when you're a new manager of a team, when it when is it a good time to point? When it is a good time to point to ask your direct reports for feedback? I worry about coming across insecure, not confident, and not like a strong boss. Great, that's a, a very common consideration, and so you you do have to feel ready. But the mindset is also important is is it's not, you know, it's not how am I doing? Am I doing well looking for, um, you know, validation? It's are you getting what you need from me? Like you can frame it perhaps in a different way early on to to um, to to kind of manage that um, perception. You know, am I supporting you in the way you need? right? Is there anything I could do differently that would help you in your work or help you grow differently? So questions like that can be framed much more user centric, like the person, <laughs> the the employee that you want to support and, uh, and, uh, and be a great leader for. So it's a little bit more, you can frame the questions a bit more like that. I love that. Actually, that's, uh, that's really well said, Gabby. And she says, thank you as well. Um, I know we were talking obviously primarily about feedback, um, but maybe you can kind of reiterate um, again, what are the top tips for giving good feedback? Just so we can have a great takeaway. Sure. Uh, for giving, you really just want to disarm that threat response, right? So, so how might you do that? So I know a lot of people hate the feedback sandwich and I'm not saying to do a feedback sandwich, but I think it's okay. Like a, people call it like a, right? Where you say, great, not so good. Yeah. Great. Right. Um, but I don't mind validate. Like, I think it's helpful to validate and help the person feel secure right off the bat. Like, you know, you could say like in that example I gave around the person not preparing, like you'd say like, and, and so another thing in that upfront piece, so you want to validate them in the upfront piece. And another thing you want to do is understand that there could be stuff you don't know about, right? Like your feedback, like there's so much else that could have gone on that you're not aware of. Um, so in giving, you want to say, um, you know, there's many ways, but one option could be, so I know you worked really hard on that. And I know you, you know, you asked for a lot of support. Like, how do you think that went? So asking that, so telling them up front, like some validation, then opening it up to them. How do you think that went? Any opportunity you can give people to self-generate feedback, especially um, an assessment, right? Or like good, bad, um, uh, can, that is some autonomy, that is some control that they can take and then that's not being done to them again. So you can open it up for them to self-generate and then you can go into, yeah, you know, I noticed that too. I wondered like, what was, what, what, what got in your way or, you know, what, what would you do differently? So you help them learn from it, but if they self-generate the same assessment that you have, <laughs> then that's great. Now, if they don't, if they don't see it that way, then there is more skill that you need to pull out to actually give the feedback. Perfect. Thank you, Gabby. Um, we do have a question here from Brenda. So from an HR perspective, how do you help an employee that is having trouble sharing feedback directly with their manager? They worry that sharing something constructive, quote unquote, can be taken the wrong way, causing tension in their work, in their role and relationships. Yeah. So very, very common. I mean, it's really hard for employees to give managers feedback. That's why it's so helpful <laughs> when they ask. Mm -hmm. um, so forgiving, uh, it's it's tough. If the manager like hasn't set the stage for openness, um, there is real risk there, right? If they haven't set the stage for psychological safety, for like low fear of dissent or critique. So, I mean, some thoughts, like I don't know the scenario specifically, but you can also, like a, a softer way to do feedback is to put it a little bit on you. Say like, you know, I've, no, I've started to notice what's really helpful for me in terms of a manager and it's really helpful when I get blah, blah, blah. Or I'm able to do, you know, my best work when I have some context and I'm fine, right? So whatever the issue is, you can, you can link it back to, you know, 
the organizational outcomes or I can do my best work or, or I have the context I need when you update me after the management meetings or whatever it is. Um, that's one idea. That's great. That's very helpful. And I also find too, I'll just jump in on that one, yeah, um, is, uh, you know, setting like HR to support the managers, to support the, the employees um, is almost like setting kind of the principles or like rules of engagement of some kind before those conversations happen so that they're, you know, they're aware on both parties, both sides that, you know, there's full transparency. Again, you talked about that psychological safety, having this a safe zone as being like, you know, a, a prime, a primary principle and having these discussions. I think just having that kind of upfront and said as a, you know, guiding principle or, yes. or you know, could be really helpful because then you can always anchor back to that, um, yeah. which will then help kind of facilitate the conversation a lot more fluidly maybe, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like setting the stage, like it's really important that we're able to have good dialogue and that like we don't, I, I don't mean anything personally. I just want exactly. to a valuable, productive work relationship. And in that spirit, blah, blah, blah. Right. Exactly. So the mm -hmm. true intention is kind of considered um, upfront and there's, you're not thinking about it in any uh, negative, negative way. Yeah. Do we have any other questions uh, before we wrap up the session? Um, some great questions. Thank you to, uh, Thank to you. the audience. Bye. 